testimony from death to life Cause Greece rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony Together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son, and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony.
Every voice. Sing a little louder. 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 Oh, sing a little louder. Come on, remind yourself to sing louder than the storm. Sing a little louder.
church, there's nothing better than Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Come on, let's play that again. up front right now and 
I'm encouraging you guys and I'm talking about the goodness of God and the faithfulness of Him. And, and uh, we repeated the worship from last week and it was Graves into Gardens. And I was just thinking about that as, as I was sitting here looking at my garden from this past summer and realizing the death of something and how there are times where your plants die and they actually look like there's no hope that no life can come back. And so a couple of my petunias from this summer that died, I cut them all the way back just to the roots. And because I did that and I cut the death off, I pruned them, which is something that God does for us. I pruned them, there's new life. And I was thinking about the correlation of that song, you turn graves into gardens. And how perfect it is because there are things in our life, our life was dead before we came to Christ. And then when he takes away all the death, he takes away all of the things that that just have produced nothing and there's no life he causes growth to come and things to bloom and it's like spring again and fruit is produced in our life and it's such a beautiful thought because so much this past summer when we were in quarantine and I was sitting on my back porch and I was looking at my garden and I tried so hard to be a gardener. Miss Sarah did such a good job teaching me, gave me all the tools. And it was a learning curve and maybe I'll do better next summer. But, but I was looking at the death of my garden. And then this song and I was like, but God, he turns those graves, those things that are dead back into a flourishing garden. Well, anyway, right now I'd be saying hug your neighbor. So if online you want to comment, good morning, hey everyone, we would love to hear from you. Um, and I'm just going to run through a couple of quick announcements just to kind of catch you up to speed on how things are. Um, Clint's going to address a little bit more about what's upcoming in the future for our services. But just to let you know that the bow shoot that is going to be next Saturday has been rescheduled. Not quite sure when. But our bow shoot was Saturday, September 19th. That is rescheduled, but the women's conference is not. So the women's conference will still take place Saturday, September 26th at um, Life Fellowship. It's gonna be all day Saturday. It's gonna be incredible. Um, looking forward to that. Ladies, if you have not registered, you can still do so. Um, and just to let you know that things with that are going ahead. We had small group launch this week. I believe we are gonna postpone that and we are gonna wait for small groups to launch the next week. So instead of the week of September 13th, which is this week, we will launch next Sunday, um, next week. And I will be sending my small group leaders out a email. I also want to remind you of the Student Life Ministries, um, their Bible initiative. You guys were so generous last week. I don't even remember. Do you remember how many Bibles that were purchased for our students? It was incredible. It was above and beyond the expectation of Pastor Taylor and Michelle. And if you want to do that this week, if you want to purchase a Bible for our students, they are $40. We are purchasing them a Bible that they can use for their lifetime. They're really nice leather bound. Um, and that's for all the students that come to our student ministry in the month of November. So if you want to do that, you can do that next week. And as always, thank you for your generosity in giving to Life Fellowship. We are so blessed because of you. Um, and just to let you know, I miss you all this morning. And I'm going to turn it over to Clint. How's that for a tag team? Hey, welcome. I join Claire in, in welcoming all of you to this uh, special edition of our Sunday services. A lot of things are going on and we're excited that we're able to come to you in this format. Thank the Lord for technology. And I thank God for each one of you joining us this morning. 
Uh, we're going to call this uh, Back Porch Sunday. As you can tell, the background is different than the typical Sunday morning within our Life Fellowship facility and campus ministry. So um, Claire shared with you a few things regarding the upcoming events. And I want to speak to the matter at hand, the reason we are coming to you in this way this Sunday morning is because as was stated uh, earlier this weekend as we made an official statement since March and the outbreak of the coronavirus God has blessed us and helped us the last six months and we had not experienced any COVID-19 cases in our church family well the latter part of this past week on Friday we found out that two of our primary leaders were tested positive for COVID-19 so we started putting together a strategy for this weekend and the days ahead and we wanted most of all to protect all of Life Fellowship's members attendees and adherents that would be on campus ordinarily this weekend. So we made the decision to suspend our in-person services today, as well as our Celebrate Recovery uh, meeting on Monday evenings on the campus of Life Fellowship, as well as our Wednesday gatherings, including adult and children's ministry, as well as uh, Life Student Ministries. So we wanted to pause for 10 days and allow the building to be vacant, allow each one of you to be isolated somewhat from one another and gathering together for any given ministry event. So if you would bear with us, we have your best interest in mind and we just wanna do all that we possibly can do and every precautionary measure to protect you and your family members, especially our children and our elderly, and those of you that may have a compromised immune system. We just wanna be safe and err on the side of safety and caution. So thank you for your understanding. Thank you for uh, walking with us through uh, these uncertain moments. And we're just trusting that after next weekend, we'll be able to gather in person on Sunday, September the 20th. That would mark the 11th day that we have been quarantined from one another and quarantined uh, from the campus of Life Fellowship. So we made this decision. It wasn't an easy decision, but we and uh, key leaders and when I say we myself and our board of deacons and some other key leaders helped us arrive at this decision so that is the latest update also I want to uh, pray for these two key leaders I, I want to protect their privacy but if you were on campus from last Monday till uh, the present then um, those are the individuals that would have been exposed to these key leaders. It's not so important that you know who they were or are, but just so you know that if you were on campus since last Monday, you uh, just need to know that uh, you possibly could have been uh, exposed or had some kind of contact with them. So that's why we made the decision for the 10 day quarantine. We want to pray for those uh, two uh, gentlemen, as well as our congregation, that God would protect and give strength and health. Also, before we go to the Lord in prayer, we want to lift up uh, our state, in particular, uh, the southwest region of Louisiana that suffered uh, the effects of Hurricane Laura a couple of weeks ago, and now the tropical storm Sally that's out in the Gulf and is projected to hit the southeast coast of Louisiana. We want to pray for our protection as well, all those that are in this part of Louisiana, and that God would just do something incredible and miraculous in these next couple of days. I understand by watching the latest news report that 
This storm is scheduled to uh, touch landfall somewhere around Monday or early Tuesday. So we're going to pray for protection and safety. We're going to go a step further and pray that God would allow this storm to dissipate, that we would have no effects from this storm that um, is directed toward us. So would you just pause with me and bow your heads and your hearts right where you are, and let's just pray for all of these special needs this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you, and we ask that you hear our request. God, we've gathered in your name all over the St. Charles Parish area. God, even though we're not together in person, we are together in spirit. We're together in communication because of the technology that we have. And we're just asking you to hear us as we agree together that you would respond to our cries, to our petitions. We ask, oh God, that you heal those gentlemen that have been affected by this coronavirus, that have tested positive. We pray that you touch them, give them a speedy recovery, that you would uh, allow this virus to not take full effect, but there'd be minor symptoms that they experience that you would allow their body to continue to heal, regenerate their bodies, God, in such a way that they would have a speedy recovery. I pray for our church family and community, those that may have had direct contact with these two gentlemen, I pray that you would protect them. I pray that they would not have any symptoms or any effect from this virus. For our whole church body, I pray for protection from the youngest to the oldest. I pray that you'd keep us safe and healthy is our prayer. God, be with us in the next several days ahead. I pray, God, that we would experience the healing provision of Jesus Christ. I pray for our brothers and sisters and all of our family and friends that are in the southwest part of our state of Louisiana that were hit so hard from Hurricane Laura. I pray as they rebuild, as they gather strength, physically and spiritually and emotionally. I pray that you would continue to walk with them and help them as they recover from this storm. God, I pray that you'd protect the southeast part of Louisiana. This storm that is directed toward us, God, I pray that you would give strength, protection, I pray, God, that you'd cause this storm to dissipate in the name of Jesus. I pray that you'd keep us in the center of your will and protection. Bless every need that may be represented in our church body is our prayer. We ask you these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today is definitely going to be a different delivery as I share a message with you. I think the content is so very appropriate to us today. If you've been with us on Wednesday evenings for the past several weeks, we have been studying end times and especially the book of Revelation. And there's some fascinating truths and so many figurative and metaphorical as well as uh, real events that will take place in the future days that are ahead of us. And we've been studying how all this culminates in the beautiful plan of our Creator, our Father, from the very beginning to the very end of the Bible, we read this plan unfold. And uh, we're almost on the last part of Revelation. And by the way, as a footnote, uh, we will come to you live on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. via all of our digital platforms. So if you have been uh, studying the book of Revelation with us, this coming Wednesday will be our last episode or our last chapter in the book of Revelation, chapter 22. So we'll finish our 
study on end times this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m. as we broadcast from Facebook Live. So keep this in mind in your weekly schedule. And again, we continue to pray one for another this week relative to the storms that are heading our way. So uh, today I want to share a message with you that I've entitled Packing Your Coffins. And I don't want this to give any uh, connotation of a morbid physical death. It's more of a spiritual backdrop that I want to share with you regarding this title. And uh, I, I placed this title for this message from a true story that I've read recently. And I want to read a snippet of this story to you this morning on the subject of packing your coffin. Over a century ago, many brave missionaries were known as one-way missionaries. Uh, they would purchase their one-way ticket to the mission field without a return ticket. This was happening in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And instead of their suitcases, they would pack their few earthly belongings into coffins. They sailed out of port and waved goodbye to everyone they loved and everything they knew. They knew they would never return home. What a calling, what a mindset in those days to where God would move upon the hearts of men and women to go to foreign lands to share the good news of Jesus Christ, knowing that they never would return home to their family and friends and all those acquaintances that they had back in the United States. So a question that I want to pose to all of us this morning, and this question is somewhat continual in our lives as we walk out our relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is the question, what's keeping us from going all in with our relationship with Jesus? What's keeping us from giving our all and surrendering our all to Jesus Christ? There's such a thing called the inverted gospel. The inverted gospel is not Christ-centric, but it's a me-centric gospel. It's less about me serving God's purposes and more about Him serving my purposes. Our mantra, our song of declaration is more about, instead of I exalt thee, God, it's more about I exalt me, God. It's the gospel's counterculture. So the question is, who's following who? Some believers think that they're following Jesus, but the reality is this. They've invited Jesus to follow them. So I want to point your attention to a story, a real account of Jesus having this conversation. The Bible refers to him in some translations as the rich young ruler. Other theologians point to this possibly being a young, an attorney or a lawyer, one that was very affluent, one that was of the Jewish culture. Naturally, he was a, a Jew that followed all the teachings of the Torah or the Pentateuch or the, the, the book of the law, as we refer to it. And it picks up in chapter 19 in the book of Nat Matthew. I want to begin reading at verse 16. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replies, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You should not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbors as yourself. All of these I've kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, and this word perfect is taken from the original 
understanding of what Jesus meant. It means to be complete, whole, W-H-O-L-E, to be perfect, to be complete, to lack for nothing. Jesus says, if you want to be complete, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Do you get the, the, the gravity of this statement that Jesus says, and come follow me? Could it possibly be? This is just kind of a footnote and maybe a little bit of my opinion. Could it possibly be that Jesus was looking for disciples to follow him wherever he would go? To give up life, to give up the pursuit of personal goals and personal aspirations? To possibly give up family and friends and close acquaintances? Just like these missionaries that were one-way missionaries that I shared earlier as we began this message this morning. He says to this young lawyer or this rich young ruler, then follow me. And look what verse 22 says. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. This man had good intentions. And he was wanting to do the right thing. That's why he asked Jesus this question. He had the right motives initially. But it wasn't exactly the way he perceived or way, the way he thought it would look. The cost was too great for him. He was not willing to give up some of these things that were so dear to his heart and, and replace or restructure his perception and mindset when Jesus asked for him to follow him. The cost was very great. Too much of a price that this young man was willing to pay. It reminds me of another missionary story, a missionary by the name of A.W. Milne. He had set sail for an island in the South Pacific Islands, knowing full well that the tribes of headhunters had murdered every missionary that had gone before him. Milne didn't fear for his life because he had already died to self. That's very key. He had already died to self. 35 years Milne lived among the tribes and loved them. When he died, the tribe members buried him in the middle of the village and they inscribed this epitaph on his tombstone. When he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. This missionary, A.W. Milner, did not play it safe. In fact, he lived a dangerous life with a dangerous message, with a dangerous people, so much so that he gave up everything that he knew. In fact, he was willing enough to give his own life so that the good news of Jesus may be declared. And for 30 years, as I read just a moment ago, he poured his life into this island and the tribes that were reached were forever changed with the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It wasn't an inverted gospel. It wasn't about this missionary. No, it was more about Jesus and what Jesus wanted to do through Milne to reach the people that have yet to hear the good news of Christ. Jesus didn't die for us so that we could place it safe. He didn't die for us that we could, he could keep us safe. He died to make us dangerous, to, to go out into a dangerous world, to begin to minister to people that at times it would be somewhat dangerous, but the cost is worth it. My question to all of us is what influence do we offer those all around us? Do we follow Jesus in a way that makes us dangerous? Not to the people that we share life with, but dangerous to the enemy of our souls. Satan himself is trying everything to do to destroy 
not only us, but our influence on others. Not only our influence on others, but everything that we could allow Jesus to do through us. The Bible says that he, the enemy of all that we are, the devil himself, comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. He tries to destroy our message that we proclaim through our mouth and a life that we live. And we influence others. He wants to destroy our communication. He wants to destroy our influence. So, what influence do we offer to those around us that makes it dangerous for the enemy? Are, are we willing to go all in when it comes to the message that Christ has called us to proclaim as he does ministry through us? Are you following Jesus in such a way that you're making a difference in other people's lives? What I believe God calls us to is consecration. This word consecration is not used very often in our cultural vernacular. It's not used to communicate um, a message of hope that people can receive that changes their life. But this word consecration means to be set apart. A set apart for what purpose? Set apart to live our lives in such a way that it demands a change of lifestyle. Not only within our lives, but in the lives of family, friends, acquaintances, people that we rub shoulders with, people that we do life with, that we make such an indelible impression upon their lives and we influence them in such a way that their lives forever change by our influence. That's the, the dangerous lifestyle that I'm talking about living. That's what Jesus calls us to. When he says, follow me, he says, I want to do something in and through your life in such a way that your life and others' lives are forever changed. When it comes to consecration, it's the complete interest in what God wants to do in us and through us. It's giving power. To God, giving God veto power to veto anything that is not of interest to the kingdom. Anything that we kind of get sideways, we kind of want to go our own route that's not a part of God's purpose and plan, not only for our lives, but for the lives that God's called us to reach. Is surrendering all of you to all of Him. You know, it's easy to sing a song that has lyrics that point to us surrendering all that we are to God. It's another thing of walking that out. So it's a matter of surrendering all of you to all of Him. It's simple recognition of every second of time, every ounce of energy, and every penny of money is a gift from God and for God. Consecration is an ever deeming love for Jesus, a childlike trust in our Heavenly Father, and a blind obedience to the Holy Spirit. I want to remind you of another occasion in the ministry of Jesus. It's found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, beginning with verse 18. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Now, at first glance, we would think Jesus is being a little callous here. He's being a little uh, insensitive to this man that wanted to follow him, but yet Jesus communicated to him, look, you don't worry about your father's funeral. You drop everything and follow me. But 
Well, you got to understand a little bit more regarding this dialogue that he's having with this man. The true meaning of this statement that Jesus makes to this man, it's, it's of the understanding that this man was taking care of his father. In other words, this father had not died. He wasn't dying. The father was just being taken care of by this man. And it could have been years before this father actually died. So that's what Jesus is saying to this man. This man says, let me first go and bury my father. Meaning, let me first allow uh, time to go by until my father dies. And then I'll follow you. That's why Jesus responded in this way. He's saying that sometimes the call of God is costly. So Jesus is wanting us to put our personal plans aside as selfish as they may be at times as possibly from the first glance not so selfish just wanting to do the right thing there are times when when God calls us away from that so that his purpose can not only be revealed but his purpose can be played out in our lives Jesus said and follow me and let the dead bury their own dead you know the original disciples which became apostles all of them gave up life. They gave up everything. Not only to follow Jesus, but even after Jesus was crucified, was buried, and rose again on the third day, and spent 40 more days with his disciples, and then ascended to heaven, and then sent the Holy Spirit to be with those disciples to fulfill the call of God upon their life and to follow the instruction that Jesus left for them to do. These disciples gave up everything. They truly surrendered all to Jesus' call upon their life. They truly packed their coffins. They truly followed the leading of the Lord in every way. I want you to hear the account of each of these disciples as they were dispersed from Jerusalem and went into the regions of the known world just as Jesus said they would. In 44 AD, King Herod orders James the Greater, one of the two James that the Gospels record of being the 12 disciples, orders James the Greater be thrust through with a sword. He was the first apostle to be martyred. Then Luke was hung by the neck. Doubting Thomas was pierced with a pine spear, torched with red hot plates and burned alive in India. Philip was tortured and crucified. Matthew was stabbed in the back in Ethiopia. Bartholomew was flogged to death in Armenia. James the Just was thrown off the southeast pinnacle in the temple in Jerusalem. He survived the fall, but then was clubbed to death by a mob. Simon the Zealot was crucified. Judas Thaddeus was his name uh, more so that he was referred to. Thaddeus was beaten to death with sticks in Mesopotamia. Matthias was stoned to death and then beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down. John, as we refer to as John the Beloved and John the Revelator, John survived his own execution as he was, was boiled in hot oil, yet he survived and then was exiled to the Isle of Patmos where he wrote the revelation of Jesus Christ. All of these apostles answered the call of Jesus when Jesus said come and follow me but for us God is not asking 
us to die for his cause. It's the opposite. He is asking us to live for his cause. Not to live the way you want to live, but the way he wants you to live. He's asking you to die to yourself. He's asking you to die to all the worldly pleasures and all the things that separate and distance us and isolate us from his call and purpose for our lives and anything that gets in the way of him living through us. You know, sometimes we get clogged and blocked by our culture's junk sometimes. The Bible tells us specifically that we are in the world, we're to live in the world, but not of the world. And there are times that if we're not careful, we'll get the residue of the world on us and it has a tendency to, to clog up and block what God wants to do through us. I want to remind you of Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. As Paul writes, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body, but trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we crucify, we, we put to death, we annihilate and eliminate everything that would block Jesus doing what he wants to do in us and through us. Luke 9, 23 tells us, as Jesus once again has a conversation with his disciples, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Not Jesus's cross. That was a cross too much to bear for, for all of us. That's why Jesus went in place of us. He took our place. But he says to take up our cross, whatever that means for your life. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever wants to lose their life from me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their self? This rich young ruler that we read about earlier in this message was the epitome of religiosity. You know, religiosity and hypocrisy are kissing cousins. You know, back in the days of theater, this was hundreds of years ago. The actors were referred to as hypocrites. The actors would play a part. The actors would play a role. That's where we get the word hypocrite, thus hypocrisy. This rich young ruler, in some degree, was religious and he was willing to pay a, play a part, but not willing to give up everything to follow Jesus. If we hold on to God, we will receive everything that God wants for our lives and wants to do in our lives. But if we hold out on God, we miss everything he wants to do in us and through us. I've never met anyone possessed by a demon, but I've met many that have been possessed by their possessions. It's all about what life is and what life can be like for them outside of God's will and purpose for their life. They don't own things. Things own them. The rich young ruler was like this. He was his own shot caller. He called the shots. He had everything money could buy, but something was still missing. That's why he asked Jesus the question, what am I still missing here? I, I, I've followed all the laws, all the commandments. What am I still missing? And, and, and Jesus threw him a curveball. 
something he was not expecting. He says, well, take everything you own, because I know you own a lot. Take all of your possessions, all of your wealth, and give to the poor. Give it away and follow me. And we know the end of the story because I've read it earlier. The, the rich young ruler was not willing to do this. This was what he was missing. He was missing that key ingredient. He couldn't pay the price that it took to gain eternal life. And let me say this. Eternal life has a price tag too much for any of us to pay for. The price has already been paid because of what Jesus did. Jesus paid the price. But there is a price to discipleship. And the price is willing, not always having to give up everything, but willing to give up everything to follow Jesus. And this young man was not willing to pay that particular price. There was something that this young ruler recognized, but he could not make the move. He could not pull the trigger. He could not say, okay, yes, I will do what you've asked of me, Jesus, and I will follow you wholeheartedly. He couldn't pay the price it took. Recognition and follow through are two different things. Yes, it's more easy to recognize what we gotta do. It's more easy to recognize what Christ calls us to. It's a different story to follow through on that same thing. The story of the rich young ruler is one of the saddest stories in the Bible because he had so much upside potential. There's no telling how God could have used this young ruler to do so many great things for the kingdom. So many great things that Jesus could have used this young ruler to accomplish. So much potential, but yet... He did not make the decision to follow Jesus in the way that Jesus invited him to. So sad. He could have leveraged his resources, his network, his energy for the kingdom causes, but he spent it all on himself. He thought that it would make him happy, but instead it made him miserable. The Bible says that he walked away way very sad very contrite, very disappointed. This reveals that our greatest asset becomes our greatest liability. We too, at times, if we're not careful, can be just like this rich young ruler. If we don't use what God offers to us for God's purposes. So let me make sure I'm communicating this very clearly. We're not talking about just money or possessions here. We're talking about a kingdom principle. Losing our lives so that we find it. Giving up something to receive something greater in exchange. That's what Jesus offers when he calls us to follow him. To give up everything. To give our life to him. Put our life in his hands so that he can do with us, with our life and through our lives, a greater purpose. So my question to you this morning as we wrap up this message today, what is God asking of you today? What is it in your life that is blocking you from going all in with God and selling out to God? And willing to give up whatever God asks of you to give up. Willing to say, yes, God, I know there's some things in my life that are blocking, that are clogging up uh, a continual flow of your spirit in my life and working through my life so that I can be dangerous for the kingdom's sake, so that I can do great things for you, God, so that I can be what you want me to be and that I can follow you, that I will take up my cross daily and follow you and and whatever you ask of me i'm willing to do sometimes that's a hard tall order sometimes that's not as easy as it seems but there are times in our walk in our relationship with jesus that it's not easy it's difficult but are we willing to do that 
Are we willing to surrender and give up? Are we willing to go all in? Are we, are we willing to sell out to what God wants and give over to him all those things that he's asking us to give up? I believe, I believe as the days draw nearer, I believe as we get closer and closer to that second coming that we've been talking about on Wednesday evenings, I believe that as we get closer to that time when Jesus is going to come back for those that are ready, those that are living a life that is righteous and holy and naturally the only way we can do that is through Jesus and his sacrifice and his blood applied to our lives. And as, as we live our life pleasing to Jesus, there are going to become times more so than ever before as we approach that day of his appearing that things will get more and more difficult so my question is a continual question that we ask ourselves every day are are we willing to give up whatever god calls us to give up are we willing to go all in and sell out to god and allow god to live in and through us so that we are truly dangerous for the kingdom and that we are doing great things in these last days this question should ring in our minds every day every day that we rise from our sleep every day that we wake up our thought our prayer should be God today if there's anything that you need to clear any blockage anything that impedes you working in and through my life I believe we need to make that prayer a serious prayer a dangerous prayer something that we should offer to the Lord every day I believe that the time is coming it's nearer than it's ever been before you can just look around you at all the things that's going on in our society. I'm telling you, 2020 has been so bizarre. We have these storms. We have this COVID-19 that is, to say the least, so very unprecedented, so very abnormal than what we've experienced in the last hundred years. I believe it's just another sign that we're getting closer. And when we get closer, the dividing of those that are going all in for Jesus and those that are not willing, like this rich young ruler, to selling out to Jesus, unwilling to sell out, I believe there is becoming a more distinctive divide. And I desire more than anything for you to be on the winning side to be on the side that goes all in for Jesus to give your life as a surrender to him that he wants to do in and through you his purposes so that you and I are dangerous ambassadors for Jesus just like these one-way missionaries that I shared at the beginning of this message of this story of those that packed all their personal belongings in their coffin and they set off to follow the Lord's purposes for their lives. Are you packing your proverbial coffin today and every day ahead? to be a part of God's plan for your life and to follow Jesus wherever he would lead so that you can be his hands, his voice to a people that you associate with possibly on a daily basis, to people that you are called to influence. I want to begin and end this time with prayer. As we prayed earlier, I want to pray as we conclude our time together. Would you bow your heads with me and as I pray, would you answer that question in such a personal manner? 
Are you willing to God, are willing for the Lord to remove any blockage, to remove any impediment that would stop Him working in and through your life so that you may go all in for the purposes of Jesus? Would you bow your heads? Father, thank you for our time together in your word. God, help us not to be like these individuals that we've illustrated through scripture today. That we're not willing to pay the price, whatever that looks like in 2020. Uh, assuredly, it looks different than it did in the first century. God, but I pray that whatever that would look like for us today, I pray that we'll be willing to say yes. That we're willing to go all in. We're willing to sell out. To be dangerous for God's sake. For the call of Jesus on our lives. And we're willing to take up our cross daily and follow you, O Lord. As we answer that question every day i pray that you would empower us with your holy spirit and allow us to walk out our faith with our primary focus of we want to please you and honor you O lord in everything that we do and everything that we say and all that you've called us to for the sake of the gospel Bless your people. I pray, O oh Father, if there's anyone looking on that's viewing this live stream today, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them. If they have not sold out to you, O oh God, and not have gone all in in their relationship with you, I pray that you would draw them by your Holy Spirit. May they put their trust in you, O oh God, today, and may they surrender their lives completely to you. Thank you, God, for this time together. Now help us, God, in the days ahead to walk this call, this commission, this declaration out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you for joining us today in this live stream broadcast from the back porch. We're praying for you and we're believing for health and safety in the days ahead. As a reminder, we will not have in-person service on Wednesday, our midweek gatherings. The campus at Life Fellowship will not be open, but we are planning to resume our in-person services next Sunday, nine o'clock and 11 o'clock a.m. If that changes, we will let you know, but at this point we're planning to meet in person next Sunday in those two opportunities to gather at Life Fellowship. In the meantime, we will continue to pray for those that have been affected by the COVID-19. We pray that you would experience the healing touch of Jesus. We're praying for our southeast region of our state in the next couple of days as this storm holly is approaching us and we pray that god would protect us and keep us in his care if you have a need please go online our website our church app and make your prayer requests known and we will be praying with you and believing that god meets you at the point of your need as always, Claire and I love you. We want the best for your life. Stay safe. And we look forward to seeing you next week in person. Have a great day. God bless you.